Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. I have a very special featured guest uh, for this week, uh, another Brit, the ever colourful and fearless uh, Katie Hopkins. Welcome to Wilms Front. Thank you very much for having me on. I don't know if we're allowed to say that I'm a colourful these days are we that might be racist in itself yes uh, there, there's lots of uh, synonyms in the, the english language i should have come up with uh, another now <laughs> when we uh, first uh, teed this uh, interview up it was uh, friday the, the 19th of june and it was 1 a.m uh, australian time or which would have been on the, on the Saturday. And so I went to bed and then woke up the next day that uh, you'd been permanently banned on, on Twitter. Uh, you'd had over a million followers there and had been retweeted by uh, President uh, Trump, which that, uh, it was, it was pretty uh, sensational, uh, the, the headlines uh, the next day. Everyone thought that you'd been silenced, uh, but uh, you're back more than ever, you've already got back a quarter of your followers on Parler now. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. So, yes, Twitter removed me from their platform. I think we can all agree there is no point looking for rhyme or reason why that happens. Uh, the only thing that we have in common if we're removed is that we had influence, um, for good or bad, but we had influence with a large number of people. And as we head towards the November elections in America, so we will see uh, voices of influence removed from Twitter, YouTube, as we're seeing now, and other platforms as the Democrats and those who fund them step up their efforts to get rid of Trump as president. And so I see myself as a, almost as a, I'm a side story to that. The real story here is that the Democrats will stop at nothing to remove President Trump. And you, you've never cared what people think of you. In fact, your Twitter bio, you owned all of the, the insults uh, against you. You described yourself as the biggest bitch in Britain, Milo's mum, the female Farage, and angry Alan DeGeneres. <laughs> yes, and that worked better actually when, so I had um, quite extreme brain surgery. I mean, brain surgery is extreme, but mine was quite extreme. My, my scar went from the top of one ear all the way over to the top of another ear. And so I had to have my head shaved. So for a long time there, I had short hair. And through that phase, people likened me because Americans struggle with short hair on a female and they assume you're a lesbian, which there's no problem either way. I'm married, but and I have a husband, but uh, you know, uh, that's fine. But because I had that sort of short haired, maybe she's a lesbian thing, uh, people thought I was angry at Ellen DeGeneres. So that comparison, and Milo's mum, so I had bright white short hair, some kind of midlife crisis, I suspect. And because of that, people thought I looked like Milo's mum. So those were those references that are, don't make as much sense now that I have a little bit more hair back. Well, you still use uh, on. Uh, formerly on your Twitter and on your, your parlor profile picture, you with short hair and, and pink hair as well, which uh, dyed hair, it uh, reeks of SJWism as well. I don't think it's as bad as blue dyed hair. Yes, I know. I keep it there because uh, that was a time in my life that was uh, fundamental to me. I was cured of epilepsy and there was a time when I had horribly shaven hair, a massive scar. And one day my radio producer said to me, oh, for God's sake, pull yourself, she was an Australian actually. And she said, pull yourself together. You haven't got, you're not having chemotherapy. You need to get a grip. And so I went out, had my hair dyed white and then pink and started to get a grip of myself. And so that photo means something to me. And I like the fact that it annoys uh, the trans lobby because I look like a lesbian. It annoys the LGBT massive because people mistake me for a lesbian. And of course, the right on LGBT people don't want me anywhere near them. So so there's, there's all sorts of reasons I like it. Conservatives are always telling me, change your photo. You look much better now. You look younger now. But I quite like that phase of my life. It was a, a kind of a rebirth of the Hopkins. 
Now, you've been completely deplatformed by your native uh, British mainstream media, despite uh, for over a decade you were a, a darling of them, but you found a, a new home here in the Australian media, appearing now regularly on Sky News Outsiders program on, on the Today Show with uh, Carl Stefanovic. Uh, you can add Wilmsfront uh, to that uh, list tonight. And I remember when, it's when you first appeared on 60 Minutes Australia, which was also with uh, uh, Carl, uh, there, was, uh, there, there was mass uh, outrage on Australian uh, Twitter uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Carl was, was speaking to you. And uh, Paul Barry, the host of our ABC Media Watch program, he wagged his finger at, uh, at Channel 9 and then uh, Sky News uh, uh, Outsiders, uh, uh, saying you should, shouldn't give Katie Hopkins a platform. So apparently now that if you do interview Katie Hopkins, there's an interview disclaimer you have to <laughs> read at the beginning, which is, I support all of Katie Hopkins' views and then some more. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for saying that. That's very, very sweet of you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Carl has been amazing understands me and understands that we can laugh and say our own truths without requiring that anyone else believes them. We're just sharing our opinion. And I'm very grateful to Rowan and his team there on Outsiders. Um, they've been so kind to have me on because it really takes courage to have me on. You can lose your job. You can lose your advertisers for sure. You can be forced out. So Rowan uh, Rita and the rest of them are really making a stand there and I'm really grateful and, and to yourself. Basically, if you have me on, uh, you're risking yourself in some way. There will be criticism you get. You will get very unkind attacks on you because you have me on your show. And I guess the biggest question mark over all of that is I'm a mum. Uh, my husband is in the other room. My son is in an um, his, his comprehension test that I've set him. You know, I am very, very normal and very, very ordinary, but somehow the media needs you to believe I'm a monster in order that you don't believe a single word that I say. Well, you were an ordinary person until 2006 when you, you first appeared on the, the British uh, box in the, the UK version of the apprentice and you were you were such a hit uh, that you became a regular panelist on the uk chat, chat show circuit and a few other reality tv shows and then were employed by both the, the sun and the the daily mail newspapers to provide uh, political pop culture and uh, lifestyle commentary so they clearly at the time thought that there was there was there was a lot of I watched one of your uh, the episodes of your shows, Katie Hopkins rules rules the world, where if only, uh, where one of them, one of the panelists challenged challenged that people such as yourself had no talent and were just famous for being famous. But to there's heaps of people that go on reality TV shows today and then forgotten about uh, a month later, but not you. No, and that, that's kind of you. Thank you. But I suppose I don't think uh, my ordinariness is built out of stuff that I really, really believe in. So my ordinariness is built out of, you know, a lifetime of wanting to fight for my country. I went from university where I was sponsored by the Intelligence Corps uh, to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. And I passed out of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst uh, and was offered a 35 year regular commission with uh, the British Intelligence Corps. I then went into industry because of my epilepsy. I had to leave the military uh, and I spent five years working in the East Village on Madison Avenue for a large management consultancy firms across America. Um, and so I think there's a lot of me that was uh, that made me a decent ordinary person much prior to ever st setting foot on onto a TV screen. And I think that's why I have endured and why I will endure is because I'm not really interested in, I'm not really interested in myself. I'm not really interested in my story that much. I'm much more interested in fighting for my country. And as that stands, that means getting Trump back into the White House. And it means providing some kind of hope for Brits and others, uh, Australians, South Africans, uh, other decent, 
um, people who are patriots, who are nationalist in the sense that they're proud of the nation they belong to, but feel that they no longer have a voice. I first uh, became aware of the alarming consequences in Britain of multiculturalism, uh, Islamism, appeasement and, and mass migrations in the, the early 2010s. And speaking out, uh, speaking out on those concerns was slowly, or well, it was already highly illegal uh, during yeah. that time. And when I started to, to hear uh, quotes uh, from you, I was thinking to myself, well, it's refreshing, but how are you getting away with this? How are you not hauled before one of those uh, hate tribunals or, or, or whatever? Whatever they're, they're, they're called, I know that uh, was it the, the, the most infamous uh, act in Britain is the, the Public Order Act. And, but obviously, it, it, it seems that in the end you were on borrowed time for, for quite a while. Yes, absolutely. And those attacks over the last 12 or 15 years have just increased. So, as a Son columnist, I was uh, arrested by the Metropolitan uh, Police and Crime Commission. Uh, these are the people that deal with the most serious offences in the country. They tasked the uh, homicide squad uh, to bring me in for questioning for a column in a newspaper. Uh, that case was referred to uh, the prosecution to hope to prosecute me for hate speech for saying that we needed to stop the boats. Uh, a reference, of course, to Australian policy and uh, I said that I would use gunships to stop the boats uh, and that was investigated. They tried to get me for that uh, after that. There have been a number of times where police have been involved in my life. I uh, was one of the first in the media to acknowledge that behind the rape squads, men targeting our white girls were majority Pakistani Muslim men. Because I said that I was brought in front of Manchester police but of course, that's turned out to be factually correct. And of course, they come for your house. Uh, repeat legisl um, litigation against me, sorry, uh, means that eventually they took my family home. Uh, they come for your head. A couple of jihadis tried to chop my head off. Uh, they're now in prison. Um, and they come for my children. So they report my children to social services in the hope that social services will come and take my children and in fact, each time social services have to check that my children are okay, which seems a great pity because there are children out there who need those helpful people, um, but that isn't mine. So yes, in terms of the scale of the attack, police, uh, law, lawfare, uh, physical attack and coming for my family and taking my family home. Uh, but still I endure and I haven't gone away. And uh, I think if they've learned nothing, they've learned that I'm pretty hard to shut up. And you've never played victim either. You've brushed it all off and, and kept going. Yeah, I think we have to own these things. You know, I have no sympathy for myself because I chose to put myself out there. And even when I saw the price that that would cost me, not only in terms of every job I've ever had, but eventually my family at home and other, I still continue. So that's my choice, isn't it? Um, and I also say to people, you know, people who are in the early phases of this or celebrities who are crying because someone said they look fat or they weren't as pretty as they could be, or maybe they didn't like this picture or that picture. You know, you have a choice. You put yourself out there. If you don't like what people say, you, you can choose to stay offline, sit at home on your sofa and be quiet. And I guess my question to any young people watching this is if you put something out there, be it a photo or a comment, is the only thing that you're going to accept people being nice to you? Is the only thing that the only pin, opinion you will acknowledge is someone saying kind stuff? Because life isn't like that. Life is tough and hard and we all think things and people should be allowed to say them, even if that's deeply offensive about me, about my nose, about the fact that I look a bit like a horse, whatever it is, that's okay. Because I choose to put myself out here. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because 
if you put yourself out there, there's obviously going to be people who like you and that's uh, reflected uh, in, well, not just your Twitter following, but now your parlor following as well. But uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that hate you as well. And it's how you react to that as well. And uh, we see too, too many uh, as, uh, uh, in the mainstream media wallow that, or who are quite opinionated themselves, who they, they, uh, uh, they criticize not just uh, people in the, in the spotlight, but other, uh, other types of people as well. And then they get really uh, hurt and play victim when uh, so, uh, somebody uh, fires back at them. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, they always are assertive with their opinions. They uh, swim downstream with what is the accepted narrative. So typically they only receive plaudits and applause uh, and people upvoting or echoing or retweeting their comments. But the moment they receive any kind of pushback uh, that people disagree with them, that's when they say, oh, I've received death threats and everything. Um, you know, and I, I don't laugh because it's not nice and I understand why people feel aggrieved. But, you know, I had a show that the, the British government helped fund. It was a play. Uh, or actually it was a musical, forgive me, uh, called The Assassination of Katie Hopkins and billboards went up around the country uh, promoting that musical. So in a way, there's part of me that giggles because when people say, well, I've received a death threat on social media and I think, yeah, get over yourself. I had a whole musical about my death on billboards around the country. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, you know, look, it's tough, but what I would say is a positive because there's so many positives that we miss, uh, is that the support I receive both online, on email um, and in the street is really, really lovely and sometimes overwhelming and so kind. People stop their cars to, to stop and say, keep doing what you do, keep saying what you say, keep, keep, keep going. And I get those emails every day. Um, and that really makes a difference actually. The support of people in the street really makes a difference. Yeah, that's exactly what keeps you going. And I sure saw you share on, on Parler before a, a message that you got uh, from uh, a young fan. Yeah, I, I try and um, remind, it, it's a way of also reminding people, it's not that uh, I, I want the compliment for me, it's a way of reminding people, particularly conservatives, that some of our biggest support and our biggest audience actually comes from young people. So aged, I would say, probably 13 to 17, 18 year olds. That is a massive uh, support audience and an audience that really needs us. Um, and certainly when I did have my own uh, successful radio show on LBC before I was removed, um, my biggest audience were that age group. Now, bear in mind, this was a Sunday morning radio show. It was a political commentary show with phone in. Uh, you know, the most dull show you imagine for young people ever. My biggest audience was in that young age group and it was actually a bigger show in that age group than in other chart shows or fashionable shows. So that's my belief is that our, there is hope because young people really understand what it feels like to be silenced and many, many of them can't speak out. Well, speaking of talkback, uh, why don't we go to some questions on yes. entropy? Uh, so the first one is from Matty Rose uh, Live. Uh, he is one of uh, my colleagues in the, the Australian alt media scene. He says, hi, Katie, good to see you talking to us Aussies. But didn't you know The Unshackled is an extreme far right extremist near Ninja <sighs> Media web website? How will your reputation ever recover? <gasps> I'm horrified to hear that you are extreme, extreme, far right, horror, extremist, terrorist, horror, far right. And I can only say that by being here, I will therefore look incredibly centrist. In fact, <laughs> your extreme, extremist, terrorist, far right, far right audience find them a wing, vegan. I'm, I'm virtually Greta Thunberg on here. And we've got a question from uh, Bieber Anti-Bullying. How much influence does Katie think the, the Anti-Defamation League has in getting people banned from popular platforms? Yeah, I, I think a great deal now. They have a, a sort of coordinated system for this stuff. And I've seen it in operation, not only on myself, 
but with other individuals that I now help. Um, so one of the roles I have, curiously, is helping people who are suddenly under attack, are not prepared for what it feels like, and I can be that person that can help. But essentially, there, it's a surrounding idea that, that this is their target, you, and what they do is, first of all, obviously, they organise the social media mob to come at you. Uh, others meet with the execs inside the social media platforms. Others target people that you know or associated with, business, employers, industry, uh, you know, things that matter to you on that regard. And then they attack you legally. So there will always become a legal challenge, a piece of litigation that arrives on your doorstep. Um, and then, of course, they come for you personally. So perhaps your home address will go up online. Uh, and then they also involve religious groups. So you get the Muslim council, get them involved. They work hand in hand with the Jewish organizations, get the leader of that involved. For me to be removed from Men Online, the chief rabbi was involved. The chief rabbi sent an email to my editor. That never happens, not in the history of Men Online Daily Mail has that ever happened. So there is a systematic coordinated attack involving every element of your life and involving significant religious organizations that have clout power and cash the catalysts for your complete deplatforming from the british mainstream media where all these groups that you just uh, described converged and pounced uh, was a, a tweet uh, you put up uh, after the the manchester arena uh, bombing where uh, 22 uh, Brits were, were blown up, many of them young girls who'd attended that uh, Ariana Grande concert. Uh, you tweeted, 22 dead, number rising, Schofield, that's Philip Schofield, uh, don't, don't you even dare, do not be part of the problem, we need a final solution, hashtag Manchester. You later deleted that and said what you should have said was we need a lasting solution, but because you'd put those two words together, it gave them the, the, the perfect justification for completely demonizing and destroying you. Yeah. And, you know, the learning there, I think for me, is never give them, when you're stood in front of an open goal, <laughs> don't give them the ball. Now, clearly, I'm talking about a Muslim terrorist. I want a lasting solution. Uh, I typed at speed. There's a typo in the word Manchester. But uh, I gave them an open goal. And it led to my removal from my radio show, which I love, uh, loved, and eventually my column also, because the combination of the Muslim Council and the Jewish organisations who work absolutely hand in glove is enough to remove you from anything in the UK. And what I would say is um, that the reason I missed those things, the reason I missed my radio show isn't because I had a radio show. Uh, although I loved it, um, it was because on the radio, people call your show and they, they, they talk to you like a friend. You know, they, they're in the kitchen, they're probably in their pyjamas, they were cooking a roast dinner for the Sunday, and they would just articulate their truth so honestly. And it was like a real glimpse into the heart of the country. And that's why the show was the highest rated show on a, on a Sunday, it was the best rated commercial radio show it, because it was a, a moment of truth, like a laser. And, and so the, my regret on that tweet is not that I necessarily wrote it, it's that it led to me being removed from my radio show where I really gave England a better chance to air its views. And of course, I was replaced uh, by Nigel Farage, who happily skipped into my open chair, even though he knew what happened to me. And of course, what we've just seen is him being removed in a very similar and abrupt fashion without warning or notice. And again, that station celebrating the fact that we've got our station back. It, it's a very, I'll say this, that, that station is a very tough place to work and you have to be tough to work there, either as a woman, particularly as a conservative, there are no conservatives there now. I was getting the impression because you were on LBC and Nigel Farage was that it was sort of like the 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 two GB of the the UK. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our, our radio stations now, but obviously, uh, I was wrong in that regard. Yes, and 
uh, I, I know what you're referring to in terms of the station. There is a massive, massive opportunity for a commercial radio station here on a accessible uh, in a normal radio format for conservative radio. And we don't have it. Uh, many of your listeners may, or viewers might be unaware, but we lost, uh, we had Fox News taken from our TVs in the UK because it was inappropriate viewing for British people. I mean, in, in terms of down the road of China, we are well down the road headed towards China in terms of censorship. Well, we still get uh, Fox News uh, beamed into to our uh, screens. And uh, contrary to, to, to uh, what some of the perception uh, is about our Sky News, it's much better than your Sky News in the UK, but uh, Sky, uh, Sky News after dark, that's where most of the, the conservatives uh, have their have their shows apart from outsiders on a Sunday morning, but uh, Sky News is straight news in the the, the daytime. Uh, it's I would say hardly indistinguishable from the rest of the mainstream media at times. Yeah, but uh, absolutely six hours a every every weeknight uh, of uh, non leftist news is is better than well what the UK has got nothing. Nothing. Yeah, we we have zero in terms of conservative outlets. And even in terms of balance, I would say we have zero. And uh, I guess having come from the inside on this, I can see how there remain a few voices. So there is a radio station which suggests it's conservative, but I know well, in order to stay on the air, in order to not be banned, in order to stay uh, with an audience, they are now operating within such a small, window of things they're allowed to say, you know, the Overton window is so small uh, that actually it's almost a game. It's a bit like Tucker Carlson on Fox or Sean Hannity. Whilst they still have a platform, it's only just. And the level of nervousness around their teams, their producers are treading on eggshells. Everything has to be approved, you know, to, in order to, if you were, I'm banned from Fox because obviously I'm a far right extremist, terrorist, Nazi, far right terrorist. But if you are a contributor, you have to write down what you're going to say before you're allowed on the air. If you deviate from what you said you would say, you're never invited back. So the level of control around what is gives the appearance of being free speech it is nothing of the sort. And uh, just on that, I had no idea what you were going to say uh, tonight, and I wasn't bothered one bit. Yes, and that would be completely different to an experience were I to still be allowed on, let's just say, a BBC station. There would be three or four rounds of briefings with producers in order to agree what was being said, in order to agree what was not acceptable to say, and possibly now even a conversation with the legal team to just reinforce what is outside the permissible things to say. That's going on behind the scenes that viewers on their sofas aren't necessarily aware of. It seemed that the British media was more outraged by uh, your tweet in reaction to the Manchester Arena bombing than the continued uh, Islamist uh, terror attacks. There's now been two Islamist attacks on the, the London uh, Bridge and uh, uh, terrorism has uh, resumed post the coronavirus lockdown. There was the the Reading uh, stabbing attack. Three died, uh, but it's only through uh, people such as yourself and other uh, uh, dissident uh, commentators that it was actually a gay hate crime. And that doesn't seem to have been picked up much because the, the attacker was Islamic. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll try and make this sh the short version. I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners will be aware. Um, and I do love a model, as we've seen. So I'm going to use my driving license and uh, a debit card to demonstrate. <laughs> don't, don't show the uh, any I identifying features okay. there. Let's swap it over for this other card. <laughs> don't worry. But my point is, if there's two things that uh, the left have to choose between, they have to choose between being very, very tolerant of Islam. They also want to 
seem to be very, very tolerant of LGBT. But at a certain point, they can't be tolerant of both those things because Islam is an intolerant religion. And that's exactly what's happened with this hideous uh, attack on the LGBT community in Reading in broad daylight. Uh, they put it as three gentlemen were stabbed. Uh, actually, one of those gentlemen was more or less beheaded in part of this attack. And no one will talk about it because the attacker was Muslim, because it was a hate crime against the LGBT community. This was a large group of largely gay men sitting together. Um, and no one will speak of it because Labour, the left, need the Muslim vote. So they have to choose. And the people that they will choose to throw under the bus, literally, or off the top of a building, literally, will be the LGBT community. And that will come to a head in the next five years. Because by 2030, uh, births to Muslims outnumber births to all others in the UK. And if you look at the demographic of most of our primary schools now, uh, we are truly outnumbered. I am a white minority in London, Luton, Bradford, Leicester. How much longer does the LGBT community think it's got left in the UK? Because that clock is ticking, you know, and the sands of time are running very fast now. I think the Australian progressives, they haven't made up their mind which side they're going to choose left. They have got a bit more time than the UK. We're not quite at uh, UK levels of uh, diversity yet. Uh, but uh, we had the uh, same-sex marriage postal survey, it was called, in, in 2017. And the results were bro broken down by uh, electorates. And uh, the areas with the, the highest uh, no votes were in Western Sydney and in Northwest and Southeast Melbourne. And, well, I think you know the uh, correlation I'm going to make. Yes, absolutely. And it's probably easier for me to articulate it than you, um, which is, you know, diversity, uh, number one, uh, diversity doesn't exist. There is no such thing as multiculturalism. There is only cultures living in the same space that do not mix, do not integrate. Um, in our country and yours, we have the Somali quarter, the Eritrean quarter. There's the Eastern European area, and then there's the Afghan Syrian quarter. You know, this is not multiculturalism. Second up, when uh, Muslims take over a city, as they have done in Leicester, uh, that is the only diversity. You know, my question to these people is, what happened to diversity when there are no white people left? How is it only Muslims that can be diverse? Um, and I think finally, yes, there's absolutely this correlation between a Muslim community that come into our country, have no wish to integrate and in fact are utterly dismissive of Western values um, that teach in the mosque that are using a lollipop. And I've sat through this and watched this happen in Finland as well. The most, uh, you know, the typical image of Finland is a white kid with blonde hair being vaguely Icelandic or Swedish or Finnish. Uh, they use a lollipop and they show it uncovered and uh, and the lollipop is covered in flies and that's how they teach uh, men to think of our white girls as trash uh, as uncovered as dirty that anybody can use and that's what's going on in my country we are being taken over and as we're taken over this community is anti uh, lgbt they have been outside our schools on trailers with loudspeakers saying it's not okay to be gay. That's what they teach uh, their kids. I don't mind actually what their opinion is on that. What I think is concerning is that the actions behind that mean that gay men are beheaded in a British park at in the middle of a day and no one will talk about it and no one will be honest about it. Well, even now there's still hardly any media attention in the uk well the you call them the the rape gangs i'm not sure if we're, we're still on youtube i'm not sure if we're allowed to say that they're known as the the grooming gangs there's grooming been gangs. a report yep. uh done uh, by the government but it's suppressed but these uh grooming attacks on young white british girls they're they're, they're still happening the they're, they're still in operation some have been imprisoned but it certainly hasn't ended Oh, no. And you can imagine a, a lot of the stuff that I am fed um, 
you know, in confidence comes from people who work with child protection. We're just about to hear of another uh, city where the mass rape of our young white girls has been happening over the over the last few years and that's just about to break on media but of course it will be played down and for people that are unaware of these gangs they are essentially gangs of majority Pakistani Muslim men they are very clever they are systematically organized they are coordinated and they are networked and they are very very good at being able to hook in our British girls bring them into these networks where they are then used by these men and they are passed around from different groups. And you might say, how does that happen? That couldn't happen to my daughter. That, that could never happen to my family. And I've spoken to many, many young girls and families just, just like me. And it does happen because they are clever, clever, clever at how they do this stuff. So that's happening every single day in the UK and has been covered up uh, because police know that in order to progress and climb the greasy pole, you have to be non-racist, you have to not call out the awkward issues. And grooming gangs, of course, are at the apex of the most awkward of issues, because Muslims will have the power here in the UK very soon. It's an incredibly sad and sick development and you wonder these uh, police uh, and these child protection, how can they look at themselves and go to work every day and be complicit uh, of this? And I know what you mean when you talk about you've spoken to some of the, uh, the victims and their, and their families. I heard uh, a story recently and it doesn't hit you until you hear a first-hand account. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's probably, you know, just before I was removed from my radio show, not wishing to bang on about that. But, but the thing that strikes me always is some of those conversations, those were the last conversations that I had on the air just prior to being removed were super powerful. Uh, young girls from regular, you know, smart, middle-class families saying what happened to them. And, and I think that was probably part of my removal as well is, is that was really big radio at the time. Um, so anyway, the point is those are really impactful stories. This is happening every day in the UK. Um, and the few of us that are able to, uh, or have already lost everything they can take from us, which is myself and a couple of others, you know, we have the responsibility to keep helping to educate in a, as open a way as we can about what's going on here. Now, getting you deplatformed from the British mainstream media, of course, that was never going to be enough because uh, you still, well, you had your Twitter following of uh, a million uh, people and you temporarily got suspended in January this year, which it was coincidentally at the same time after you'd been presented with a, a fake award by a South African YouTuber, Josh uh, Peters, the, the campaign to unify the nation uh, tr uh trophy uh, so it seemed that uh, it was just a coincidence that you were denied a right of reply at that time when he was going around gloating about how uh, he'd uh, uh, got you to go to prague to present you uh, with with this award and did the, the the media tour yeah and i guess my challenge to josh or josh whatever he's called is, um, hey, how about you take that speech that I gave at your event um, and you put it up, put it up, put it up on YouTube, let people hear it, because actually I'm quite proud of it. I was invited to an event for a, a, something that's so dear to my heart, which is the, as I see it, the genocide of white farmers in South Africa. And I was told that this would be really to benefit the white farmers, to be supportive of them, to let them know that someone was speaking for them, all the things that I care most about. Uh, and I went and gave that speech. Um, my observation in hindsight is that it, that was a very sophisticated and well-funded operation. I'd, I'd love to see the funding behind it. Um, I'd love that speech to be put up. And uh, even in the darkest moments, because as you can imagine, having been tricked for something that you love and then be humiliated and then be removed from Twitter and that all happened on one weekend. Um, I am still human, even though I'm a complete cow and the biggest bitch in Britain and seem very hard nosed and thick skinned. Um, my hurt from that was that I really care 
for South Africans. You know, my, my focus this morning has been working with a white South African farmer and his family who fought off attackers in the night. So that's the backstory to it. And when I look at it and I try and learn, less, learn lessons from it, I suppose my learning is um, that uh, I did what I was asked to do. Uh, I'm proud of the speech that I gave. I turned up on time. I was polite to the waiters and the hotel staff, uh, polite to everybody in the room. Um, as part of the ruse against me, they said that the father who was supposed to be hosting this was ill. I offered to go and visit the father who was ill and I offered to go and bring him uh, LucasAid and grapes if he needed it. So that was all a lie to trick me. But when I look back, did I do everything I said I'd do and did I do it to the standard that I would want to know that I did it? Yes, I did. Did he use me for other purposes? Yes, but I guess he needs to own that. Uh, Josh Peters, he's South African himself. He uh, grew up in, in Cape Town, which is, is actually one of the, the better areas of, of yes, South Africa. Uh, but interesting that he currently resides in, in London. And if he's worried about people uh, inciting uh, racial hatred, uh, uh, he should just look at his own homeland. And you've been to, to South Africa yourself. You know what it's like on, on the ground there. Yes, white farmers are being hunted from their lands. And uh, I am a woman of my word, so I put my money where my mouth is. I went and lived on white farms uh, in South Africa for close to three months, um, touring with uh, a cameraman to help show the world what's happening. And uh, I can tell you, sleeping on a white farm is, is a frightening thing. And I'm not frightened by a lot. You know, in the night is when the monsters come, black gangs come. And they don't just come to steal, they tie up their victims with wire, they shoot them, they stab them. We've just had another case where a gentleman had boiling water poured across him. Uh, I can't, you know, the detail is horrific, but that's really where my heart is. And it's interesting that whoever this boy is, he chooses not to live in that country. And I suppose my challenge to him, uh, it, he can bring his camera team, I'd, I'd welcome it, is come with me to Pretoria, come with me to the white farms, come and show how clever you are uh, for those farmers who have seen their husband stabbed to death. Um, that's the reality of it. Uh, interestingly, I did bump into Josh, Joshua, whatever, the other day, uh, and I was joining, I was undercover, joining the Black Lives Matter protesters to better understand them. And he spotted me uh, before the protest, and it turns out he lives in one of the very, very fanciest bits of new money London. I'm assuming his daddy or someone paid for him to have a flat there. And he came up to me to try to talk to me to ask me if didn't I find the whole thing very funny indeed. So I politely asked him to remove himself and that I had no wish to speak to him. There was shared on, it's going around on, on Telegram, the, the messaging app. I'm not, I've, I'm not sure if you've spent any time on it. Uh, this footage from what uh, purports to be a farm attack victim. I won't go into it, but it's extremely horrific. A lot of people have replied, please don't share this here. But it's sadly, it's what is what is going on there and torture and pour, pouring boiling water on people. It looks uh, horrific. And that that is what's was happening. It, it, it's unpleasant to see. But sadly, it's the truth. Yeah, I know the footage you're referring to. I was sent it a while back. I chose not to share it yet because it's so disturbing. Um, but certainly, you know, I've sat with, let's just go to a gentleman, Bernard. Uh, these farmers aren't rich. All they have is the land that their grandfathers changed from Bushveld into farm. He arrived home one Sunday uh, with his father in the car and there was a gang waiting for him in his garage. Um, they strung uh, up Bernard with fencing wire. They bludgeoned his father to death in the bathroom. And then Bernard, as he lay there in his own blood, heard the car that brought his wife and children home with the worst sound you could ever hear, I'm sure, when you know there's a gang waiting for them. The children ran out of the car. Uh, the black gang fired at one of the children um, and then strung up the wife with wire 
and the other children watched as the parents were beaten and brutalized. So the grandfather died. And of course, it's not just the attack that is the lasting damage. Uh, the 11 year old son has tried to commit suicide because he wants to be with his granddad and believes that bullet was meant for him. And the other son has been asked to leave school because he's now a violent boy and he can't sleep. That's just one family with whom I spent time in South Africa. And that's the real honest truth of it. Um, but because the farmers are white, the world looks the other way. And in my lifetime, our lifetime, we will not have any more whites left in South Africa. They will be genocided from the land and no one will have said a word. There was a bit of mainstream media interest in Australia for a while, but it's uh, dissolved now. But that doesn't mean that uh, the white genocide is it has stopped in South Africa. It's still continuing. And this is the... Uh, uh, the old thing, just because the, the mainstream media doesn't uh, report on it doesn't mean it's not happening. No, and I suppose the, the, you know, the harder thing is seeing someone say, well, I worked in the health service and I didn't receive the personal protection I should have had and therefore that's racist. Or I had this and the police didn't come within two hours. It's because I'm black and that's racist. And those are seen as the most significant moments of our day. Pull down that statue because it might be racist. Whereas right now in South Africa, whites are being hunted, tortured, you know, burnt with blow torches um, and various other horrendous things that they do to these children and women in front of their husbands. Uh, that's happening now to white people, but they're the wrong colour. So yes, I saw that Australia had spoken about possibly offering asylum, refuge, farmlands to these brilliant farmers, but that was quickly beaten out of uh, um, Australia as seen as being kind of racist or right wing or whatever it was, whatever the crime of trying to help white farmers would be. Yes, it was, a, it was a combination of, of those uh, accusations that uh, uh, you just described. Let's uh, turn our attention to well, it's, it's the main, uh, uh, main defining event of 2020, the coronavirus pandemic. And I noticed that uh, the far left progressives, uh, they'd spent the second half of 2019 uh, with Extinction Rebellion, they were running rampant in in London, uh, standing, uh, blocking traffic and vandalizing a whole whole bunch of of properties. And the the same the same thing with the, the blocking of traffic, gluing themselves to road, was happening here in Australia. And they were very upset at the beginning of the pandemic because it destroyed uh, climate and Greta Inc. as I call it. But they quickly learned to to love the lockdown and became its biggest defenders, I think, because uh, it was another way for them to destroy the economy and capitalism, uh, have a bigger government, and of course, the, the, the cult of the NHS, as it's known, the, the lovely uh, socialised healthcare system of the, the UK, the, the, the nurses saving all those uh, coronavirus uh, sufferers. They were so busy that uh, they had time to make uh, so many TikTok dancing uh, choreographed videos. Yeah, absolutely. The Green uh, Mafia saw another way around this, which was, right, let's destroy the economy. And then when it comes to the rebuild, we can demand that we only rebuild along green lines. Um, and so they kind of regrouped around that. And my personal opinion uh, is that coronavirus, whilst being real, clearly there is a virus. And my view, it's never been that much more harmful than flu. I believe it was a man-made event um, released strategically at a time of mass gathering. My personal opinion is that um, the lockdown will be and is the greatest hoax in human history. And I do subscribe to the notion that this is part of a wider strategic play for some reordering where we are all vaccinated, all tracked, all traceable and all monitored. So that puts me out there in the in the crazy fields uh, of conspiracy theories. But I think even if you go for a more moderate interpretation, that uh, perhaps lockdown wasn't necessary or not at the cost of destroying our economies, uh, there are obvious things, aren't there? Like, how can you have 20,000 people having a protest, uh, you know, literally skin to skin, and there not be any issue with that? 
you know, there's more obvious things that are more tangible than perhaps my seemingly wacky ideas that this is part of a global reprogramming, which is what I believe Corona is. The lockdown loveys, as I called them, uh, that mob decided, they decided for themselves when lockdown was over uh, in the UK and in, in Australia, obviously, uh, it was triggered over in the, the US uh, with the, the death of, of George Floyd, and I call, call it the, the new extreme Black Lives Matter yeah. uh, 2.0, and it spread to uh, the UK, even though the UK police, they don't really go around shooting non-whites, they tend to just bust your door down if you've said something mean on the internet. <laughs> I think it was Paul Joseph Watson who said that there was only one black man who died at the hands of the UK police last year, and that was the, the second London Bridge attacker. Yeah, you'd be right. And I, um, you know, I, I think with the corona, what it brought out was this, this thing that's in human nature, and it's, and it's ugly. Uh, and, it, and it makes those experiments back in the 1960s where you know, if, if, a, if a guy was told to torture someone else, he would, if it was given instruction to do so. You know, that really has felt very present here in the UK. People's love of this idea of rules, of being told what to do, of having responsibility and accountability removed away from them, of being paid a monthly wage to sit at home and essentially do nothing, to adhere to the state in everything, and to become therefore sort of advocates of what the state has to say and miniature police forces of, in and of themselves. And I've seen that with some of my own family members, which is really distressing. People who will call out other people for not behaving in a way they think is suitable, or not wearing a mask in the way that they think is appropriate, or not distancing how they should, or not following the one-way system. The weirdness of watching people enjoy rules and becoming enforcers of rules that make no sense whatsoever has really been an insight into the darkness of, of humanity. And it's not great, but you do see how, you know, people say, it's September the 1st, 1939. You see how that happened. You see how the cult of belonging can happen. And it's happening now. We had British people. I don't think Australia went for this. But every, I think it was Thursday at 8pm, the British people gathered on their front doorsteps to clap at the sky. Now, the idea of it was you were clapping in support of the cult of the NHS, socialised healthcare. But the reality of it was sane people stood on their doorsteps and filmed themselves clapping at the sky. Who knew that could happen in an age of intelligence? And uh, the UK's uh, snitch hotlines, they were also in meltdown as well. Uh, my home state of, of Victoria, that uh, won uh, the uh, state of origin in terms of uh, calls to the, the snitch line and also the amount of fines uh, given out uh, by our local police. And it was all, it turns out now it's all for nof nothing because we've got the, the second wave uh, outbreak in our, our north western suburbs which uh, has the i was i mentioned the northwestern melbourne yes. uh, before yes. has the same demographics as uh, that other city you mentioned leicester yes. which is going going into uh, a second lockdown yes absolutely so we have locked down leicester um now one of the funny things of this so lightening the tone slightly uh is that uh i can't stand leicester i think it's disgusting i think it's uh, the dustbin of the UK. Well, there's Leicester, Bradford, Luton, Tower Hamlet, Newham, I could go on. All of these places ought to be locked down forever. In fact, if they were provided with a some sort of security perimeter and they were absolutely just closed in on themselves and never allowed out, that would suit me perfectly and actually would improve my country. But yes, yeah, Leicester, uh, nobody's allowed to say why. No one's allowed to say that it is a majority Muslim population in these zones, although it is 
No one's allowed to acknowledge the fact that whites are a minority in these places, which they are. And so it's like watching the mainstream media try and, you know, I've made the analogy, it's like watching a snake trying to shed its skin, sort of tying themselves in knots so that they don't mention the obvious elephant in the room, but they talk about anything else. Um, but I think more generally, and in a more, you know, my opinion sense, is that we were always programmed to accept a second wave. After all, what makes a first wave more credible than to already be, have you ready and not acknowledging a second wave? Um, so I don't, again, for, for my money, I don't buy into any of this second wave, maybe, but it's a flu. It doesn't kill many people. It kills people who are vulnerable anyway. And, and clearly that's a controversial opinion, but it's one I think is absolutely accurate. I feel the same way about the northwest of Melbourne. I'd be happy for that area of Melbourne to be locked up uh, for good because I'm uh, down in the uh, one of the the southernmost uh, uh, suburban areas, uh, Frankston, which uh, it's it's often been uh, mocked by our comedians, referred to as uh, uh, Boganville in the the literal ah, uh, Bogan yes. Australian. Uh, sense. But do you know how many active cases uh, we've had uh, in Frankston the, the past week? Mm, no. Zero. None? Zero. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's it. I mean, the, my favorite people are people um, well, very much like myself. But I mean, I don't mean that in terms of color or sexuality or any of the ridiculous things. Just regular people, normal people, people who want to go to work and come home, people who want their family to be okay people who want to try and stay healthy and do their best, but have a 18 beers on the weekend if they feel like it. People who want to make bad decisions sometimes, but own the consequences of it. Regular people, my kind of people, bogans, deplorables, uh, you know, salt of the earth. And, and that's really, to me, what this uh, thing that I belong to, whatever that is, that's what we are. We are the salt of the earth people. We don't ask anyone for anything. We don't expect anything from anyone. And we own we have kind of, we own our own issues. Uh, and I know that that's really strong. And I guess one of my sort of positive messages that I like to bang on about, because I think it really matters right now is that um, people feel very lonely. And the important thing to know is that you're not on your own. And no matter how much you are uninvited from something or forced off something or uh, asked to leave your church or synagogue or uh, not invited to a family gathering because of something you said, um, please know that actually you're not on your own, uh, that there are many of us from Australia, South Africa, uh, here in Europe as I am, but in the UK and certainly in America. And just because you can't hear us in the mainstream, we're there and actually we're the best of us. Uh, I also think as a whole, us sort of the earth people are more funny, we have better sense of humour, we're better looking and we've got personality. And that's something that Democrats and the left will never have. That's probably why they've uh, declared uh, war on, well, especially classic British comedy, because the, the BLM 2.0, it led to, well, the uh, firstly, the, the push to, to t uh, topple historical statues, including uh, Winston Churchill's, uh, but also the online wiping uh, of uh, classic British uh, comedy, such as uh, <laughs> Little Britain, which Matt Lucas and David Williams apologized for creating. I still think it's hilarious. It was huge in Australia, yeah. League of Gentlemen, uh, the, the, uh, the Mighty Boosh. Not only uh, have they been wiped from our streaming services, but our major DVD retailer, uh, JB Hi-Fi, I can't find, can't find those. And I also can't find any of uh, Paul Hogan's uh, shows or Crocodile Dundee movies anymore. They've all disappeared from JB Hi-Fi right. as well. Craziness, what they're doing. But um, yeah, our sense of humour is the thing that we keep with us. And in many ways, that's where lockdown has been very effective uh, at silencing voices. It's not just because of all the sort of disruption, but because we have not been able to gather in the way that we have in the past. And that's had a very significant impact for conservatives because when we're together in a room, it's a powerful way of reminding people that uh, there is hope, there is optimism, 
uh, and sort of sending people out the door with that sense of it's going to be all right. And that's what's been particularly frustrating for me is I haven't been able uh, to get amongst the crowds that I would normally get amongst to, to help uh, drive us forwards. Uh, so I'm desperate to get back on the road to do just that. It was your quoting of that famous uh, British comedy, uh, Blackadder, that got you permanently uh, banned from Twitter. You were responding to uh, somebody had, had sexually threatened you, and your response was, he better be hung, hung like a baboon, which Twitter, they, they decided had some sort of racial connotation. The, uh, the, the progressives, they think more about race than us. And we do. I know. I mean, how racist do you have to be to imagine that a baboon is in some way referring to someone of color? That's a hideously racist thing to say and not a thought I would have had, but it's the thoughts they have. I mean, that's crazy to me. Um, what I'm pretty happy about is that the thing that eventually always used as the excuse for getting me off Twitter and 1.1 million followers was that uh, it was about having testicular fortitude. <laughs> so I like that. I like that uh, balls were the reason, reason that I was removed. It was basically you're banning a culmination of uh, Twitter's uh, editorialising worsening uh, during 2020. They put up that fact check on Trump's uh, tweets about uh, mail-in ballots, and then they they hid uh, his uh, tweets about basically enforcing the law, saying that that was glorifying violence, that calling in the uh, the military, that that was. Uh, that was apparently he was even though he's the the president and then of course his his mock video about uh fake news was labeled manipulated me media and it was clear that twitter was just saying and this is a presidential election year yeah we we don't care about our conservative users we're, we've picked our side yeah yeah and that and that's why i sort of if people start saying, but this wasn't against the rules, or maybe you can appeal, or maybe this, you know, no, stop with that. There's no rationale now, there's no rules. There is only influence. If you have too much of it, you're gone. Um, so the only way you can survive is by being not that influential. So <laughs> that's not very kind, but that's just true. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you know, that, that goes on. I think we need to just always, always keep moving forward. So that's in the past. Okay, they're gonna ban Trump. They will remove Trump from Twitter before November. Fine, move forwards, find the new platform, find new ways of getting us out there. You know, that, that's very much my dynamic on this is that we can sit and look at our navels all we want. That is not going to get us moving forwards. We have to move forwards and we have to keep letting this stuff fall away from us and rebuilding. And that's why um, I'll be working hard with Parley on Parley, supporting uh, the Parley team as they try and do that because they have not picked an easy road. Uh, the gentleman behind that service, you know, he didn't just do that because he thought, oh, this will be easy. I'll set up an online platform that will have no censorship. That's difficult. Uh, and I think my job, as I see it, is to support people uh, like yourself, uh, like uh, Rowan and the team, um, that do the difficult thing right now, which is give both sides a view. I'm not interested in just my opinion at all. Um, anybody that will give both sides uh, a view, I think is really important. Um, our job is to move forwards, don't dwell on what's been done to you, get out and find what, how we take our message to people who are open to hearing our message We've got a, a super chat uh, on on that topic uh, from Origen Adamandis uh, for ten US dollars. Thank you so much. Since your successful move to Parlor, have you had any contact from John Mates, founder of Parlor? If so, have there been positive communications? Oh, bless. Yeah, of course. So uh, John and I chatted uh, as I was being set up. Uh, we had to sort an issue where someone had. Uh, pretended to be me, set up an account that Mail Online published as if it was me, it wasn't me. Uh, so we had to resolve that. Uh, but yes, John has been uh, really welcoming. And I guess in return, what I'm trying to do is support uh, John and the team. Um, and I guess a little bit of a plea from my side, it, it, you know, I say sides, it's not like a child's football match. But what I mean is a plea for supportiveness within uh, my own teams is that... Uh, 
what we do worse perhaps is is pull each other apart there's a lot of ego in the world of online um i think the boys spend a lot of time in studios uh, my choice is to be on the road and i think what we need to do is support each other and spend less time criticizing people that are trying to help put our message across and so that's really where i come at from parlor and trying that's the sort of messaging i'm trying to push through but certainly yes absolutely in conversation with john absolutely there to support him and have found him uh, to be, I find him to be admirable and brave. And, and that's what I'm trying to get across to him. Uh, Bieber Anti-Bullying has got another question. Uh, why did you go to Parler, a platform that verifies uh, users' identities instead of just going to Gab, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of Gab before. Andrew Torber uh, is the, the founder and CEO of it. Yes, and I've been in conversation with Andrew a lot. Uh, he's very kindly been very supportive, always offering a platform. Um, and it's not that I um, am not supportive of Gab, not at all, but there needs to be a choice made. Um, and I think actually it happened almost by chance because there was a an account that was being assumed to be me that wasn't me. I ended up being there to correct that. Uh, I have no strong feelings about this other than uh, parlay is somewhere I think having being able to be verified is a good thing um, I think it's useful but maybe that's because I'm swayed because I believe you have to be accountable for what happens to you and maybe that's easier to say as someone who's had everything taken you know ultimately I probably arguably I'm one of the most free people that there are despite being in one of the most censored uh, spots is that because I own nothing and have nothing uh, I'm probably freer than most. So I chose Pilot slightly by chance. Um, I didn't choose it over Gab, uh, but I think as long as we're out there, our voices is heard and feel that you have somewhere you can walk or somewhere you can find people like me and connect, um, you know, then I'm always listening. Parla also has the advantage of, for now, being on the, the app stores in Apple android uh, uh trump seems to have a good relationship with 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 tim apple uh so uh fingers crossed that he doesn't uh kick uh parlor off uh gab has been kicked off all the uh the apps but it'll be interesting now that there has been this mass migration triggered pretty pretty much by your move there you've got 285,000 followers now i think laura loom has got the most she's already cracked uh half a half a million it has really taken off a, a million more users and uh, i think uh twitter and uh, jack dorsey is scratching their head now saying wow they really did leave us and find another one yes and uh that's something i think has been great is that with my removal there was an exodus uh to exodus i guess uh, I'm grateful to have Laura Luma's support. I've known her for a very long time. And uh, she is really one of the, uh, the heroines in this. You know, there aren't many females out there who are able to withstand the level of battering and still fight on. And she really has done that. She's been on that platform for a very long time, building her audience has done very well. And I'm grateful to Laura as well. She was very helpful in setting me up on Parley and getting me introduced to John. So uh, Laura Luma deserves even if you disagree with Laura, even if you disagree with uh, Trump, actually just from the pure um, uh, sort of values of being tenacious and never giving in and pushing forwards. Laura's been doing that for a good few years now that I've known her. Um, so yeah, I'm proud of her for that. I'm proud of being a trigger for an exodus. And my uh, next ambition, of course, is to bring Trump across I'm sure we may lose uh, access to Apple and to the App Store, but I think if you have the 45th president on your platform, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you're on the App Store or not, uh, because people will come. And I think the signs are looking increasingly positive that Trump will make that move. And Twitter's uh, recent conduct, it's coincided with uh, YouTube updating their terms of service, uh, which uh, saw Gavin McGuinness uh, booted last week, Stefan Molyneux uh, this week, and, and Facebook is facing, I call it a woke advertising 
uh, revolt. Apparently, there's still too much hate speech on on Facebook, and so all these uh, corporations are pulling their advertising until that's uh, fixed. And Facebook has just introduced a new political advertising uh, policy for this election season. What a coincidence! Yeah, absolutely. And and you know the hypocrisy is so rife. I wonder if I can. I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but I'm requiring. Oh no, here it is. Okay, I'm going to see if this is not very technical, I know, but let's just see what happens. Okay, there. you can see that on your screen, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a receipt for Facebook advert. And the reason I did that, obviously it's a very small sum of money, but is to prove that Facebook will and are still taking dollars, pounds from someone like me uh, for, a, for an Instagram post that they have removed without telling me from my account and they are still taking the pounds to promote a post that doesn't exist anymore from a figure they would call hate. They'll take your money. So kids know that. I don't care if they then remove my platform. It does, doesn't make any odds to me. Know that as, it, as, as of today, that's today, Facebook are taking my money to promote me at the same time as pretending to censor me. That's what's going on. Kids, you are Facebook's content. Get off that platform. And it's happened with our Facebook page as well. They they will have removed one of our uh, posts for violating the community standards. Then the next post that says, oh, this post is performing better. Why don't you, you boost it? You just got rid of my... <laughs> yeah. Why don't you promote this? Uh, and mine, the one that they removed but have promoted at the, at the same time, was about the fact that I said, oh, I've just bought my Terrorist Lives Matter t-shirt. And this was in response to the Reading stabbings. What's the appropriate gesture for a terrorist? Do I go down on two knees? Do I bend at the waist? And that's that's the post that Facebook have taken my money to promote. So please know that, people. That's the stuff Facebook's prepared to promote. Anyway, I'm running down into my last few moments before I have to go. So uh, I suppose we should either do last quick questions or uh, anything else you want to ask. Yep. So I want, obviously, since you've been deplatformed from uh, your own mainstream media, have you thought about, well, you can't at the moment, migrating to Australia? For example, you'd still, <laughs> I think, be able to put up a, a sign or banner that says all lives or white lives uh, matter <laughs> and uh, clearly uh, obviously the the outsiders they're they're keen to uh, keep having you back on uh, so is Carl and I'd be happy to uh, um, as well we, we tend to get the 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 dud uh, UK celebs migrating to Australia such as uh, Mariam Margulies and and Ben Elton who well he hasn't been funny since Blackadder <laughs> so we could really use a high quality uh, Brit like yourself to, to migrate here. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the kind offer. Can you imagine, uh, imagine the meltdown if I said I was, we, we should maybe do this. If I said I was moving or migrating to Australia, the meltdown from the leftists would be epic. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll tease that on the next Outsiders. What I would love to do, and I've been determined to do for a long time, and then lockdown came and Australia won't let me in, but um, is come and do a speaking, a uh, number of speaking engagements, get out on the streets, uh, get up to the northwest of Melbourne, uh, get uh, amongst some of your Somali um, uh, individuals who think they have the right to terrorise Australians, uh, to take away the things that Australians love best. Uh, and a press that is being very, um, refuses to challenge them. I want to get to the police uh, department there as well and ask why they don't stand up to any of this. And uh, so I, I want to get uh, on the ground in Australia, talk well to motivate uh, brilliant freedom lovers like myself and yourself. Uh, so that will happen. The Hopkins will come to Australia and I look forward uh, to the anxiety that it creates among the weaker uh, of us, which are of course the left. Uh, because we're not uh, at uh, UK alert levels yet, uh, but we can't get enough words of warning. Before we wrap up, there is one more super chat from Dewey DeBoer, yeah. who's my uh, co-host. We do a show together, Trad Tasman Talk. He's a New Zealander. So we uh, share what's going on in the politics of us. Uh, I share what's going on in the politics of Australia, and he shares what's going on in the politics of New Zealand. It used to be called Trans Tasman Talk, but the trans uh, <laughs> triggered uh, a lot of our 
audience. So we changed it to trad. Uh, his super chat is, uh, will things get better or worse uh, for the right once in Islam purges LGBTQ W R A T Y? <laughs> He's being a bit cheeky there. <laughs> uh, well, um, commiserations for living in New Zealand, and I don't mean that in the sense of the beautiful country. Uh, I mean having Jacinda Ardern and her uh, terrifying bill that she rushed through the New Zealand Parliament while no one was looking, basically making her emperor of New Zealand able to. Yeah, I called anyone. it the Enabling Act. That's what I called it. Oh my it. goodness! Unbelievable. So that woman is, um, you know, if I had to, the, the most dangerous woman. In America, Ilhan Omar, the most second most dangerous woman on the planet, Jacinda Ardern. She, she is, she is their dream woman, and she is implementing everything by the letter. But anywho, uh, yes, will they get weaker? No, the left are only going to increase in power. The Islamification of politics will increase. Uh, we will have, we have de facto blasphemy now. We will have Sharia law in the UK. Um, and it's already in, started in the hubs of Birmingham, Leicester. You will see it as well in northwest Melbourne and other places. It will already be in operation in those places too. Well, it's it's never too late to, to turn, turn the tide. Uh, New Zealand has got their uh, election coming up as well. Due is, is supportive of, of MAGA 2020, which is make Ardern go away. That's, that's the yes. MAGA in uh new zealand there hopefully soon you can come to australia it's been an absolute pleasure and blast to to chat with you katie thank you so oh. much for, for for coming on and yeah look look more to more of your vlogs and and commentary on parlor because your vlogs are excellent they're just two minutes oh. of well the and i say this in a in a uh, polite way brutal commentary in a good sense <laughs> Yeah, I don't tiptoe around the tulips. You know, I think it, I say it, uh, you can hear it. And at no point do I ever ask you to agree with it. And I suppose I'll leave you uh, with my reassurance that if you ever feel alone, any of you out there know uh, that we are many, uh, we stand strong and together we can move forward past all of this you know agreement is never a precursor to debate all we ever want to do is debate but uh, you're not on your own i will get over there and i will put the fear of god into the right people in melbourne can't wait all right good night everybody <laughs> i'll see you next show see you later thanks for tuning in to wilms front Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.